Hi, this is Jeremy Allison with Google's Open Source Program Office and I'm here at Samba XP which is the Worldwide Samba Developers Conference. This is our 10th year and I'm here with someone I know extremely well, uh, Dr. Andrew Tridgell who is the creator of Samba. So say hi Andrew. Hello. So it's kind of hard for me to interview Sam Andrew because I've known him for so long and we end up sort of fighting like family is usually what happens, but, <laughs> but I'll, I'll try my best so that we don't come to blows. So, um, Andrew, um, it's coming up on 20 years of developing Samba. Um, how does that feel? The classic interview question. How do you feel about that, Mr. Trizzle? <laughs> oh, it's great. It, it's been a really fun project, and uh, it's particularly great that the project has gone from being a, a one-person project to one which so many developers are involved with. Uh, the, I looked at the, the stats just recently, and we just recently passed the 10,000 commits per year mark in Samba, and we had 95 developers committing to Samba in the last year, which is fantastic. It's, it's not nearly as big as many projects which have sort of hundreds of developers, but um, the socialization within the team is absolutely fantastic, and I love working with other developers, uh, getting different perspectives on, on how development, what, what features should be put in, uh, how a problem should be approached. So it's, it's the, the team aspect of Samba development has been one of the, the, the best aspects of it over the years, and it's something that I, that I hope you know, is really just going to grow into the future. So we're pretty close to releasing Samba 4, which is the Samba that will um, hopefully have Active Directory domain controller support. And as I like to joke, Samba 4 has been uh, longer in development than Duke Nukem Forever. So can you tell our listeners... I don't think that's actually true. Well, but... it's, it, it's close. It's close. All right. <laughs> maybe, maybe I'm just being too mean. But uh, maybe you could tell our viewers a little bit about what people can expect out of Samba 4. Right, well, um, I mean, each Samba release takes longer than the previous one. Uh, and so, it, you know, the very first releases in the early days, back in 1991 um, and early 92, we had, often had several releases a day. Uh, I think the first three releases came in the first day, and then there was, you know, frequently several releases in a day over the, for the following months. As projects get older, users have greater expectations in terms of compatibility and features, and it takes longer to get a release out. And that's, Samba is no exception. Um, so Samba 4, the whole effort started as an effort to redo the file server backend uh, with a thing called the NTVFS branch, which was an attempt to um, create richer uh, NT file system like semantics within the file server portion of Samba. Um, that effort has largely been shelved and what the Samba 4 has morphed into is uh, an attempt to create a credible replacement for Microsoft Active Directory. And so that the key focus on Samba 4 development over the past few years has been being a, an Active Directory domain controller, replication with other domain controllers, and having sufficient features that uh, quite large organizations would be able to put Samba in beside existing Microsoft domain controllers or uh, replace Microsoft domain controllers with Samba domain controllers and know that they will end up with a quality directory server. Um, that's required an, a lot of effort. Uh, it's required a huge amount of code and some um, whole new ways of approaching coding in Samba, a lot more generated code, for example, uh, in Active Directory, uh, now what we've been doing with the Samba 4 than in previous versions of Samba. Um, it's, it's an ongoing effort. We won't have all the features of Active Directory in the first version, but I think that 4.0, when it comes out, which I hope is in the next few months, um, is going to be something that we can be really proud of, and it will be... Uh, it will take Active Directory from being something that's Microsoft only to being something that is much more open and is available to a lot more vendors and I hope it will introduce some real competition into the Active Directory market. So the interesting thing about this conference in, and actually the past few Samba XP's is that Microsoft have actually sent developers here. Um, to uh, participate, give talks in the conference. So what do Microsoft think about 
Sam before and Active Directory, and what's the relationship like? What's your working relationship like with the Microsoft guys? Uh, with the Microsoft engineers, the relationship has been very positive. Uh, as you say, there's been several Microsoft engineers who turned up to this conference, and they're very willing to discuss um, the technical details that we we need to know. Um, that relationship it's been up and down over the years. In the very early days of Samba, Microsoft was very supportive of what we were doing. In fact, one of the earliest uh, contributions to Samba came from Lee Fisher from Microsoft, where he was assisting us with something related to the Landman protocol. Uh, Landman extensions to the core SMB protocol, uh, which was great. Th there was then a period of a few years where Microsoft was less helpful and it was very difficult to, uh, to work with them on a technical basis. Uh, that's improved a lot over the past few years, uh, partly as a result of the result of the European antitrust case, um, but also I think uh, there's a a greater willingness among the engineers themselves and to work with us. Um, they no longer get in trouble when they work with the Samba developers and engineers like to talk about code. They like to talk about engineering, they like to talk about technical problems and so once the Microsoft engineers were no longer being prevented from talking to us uh, and working with us directly, they really put a lot of effort into that and have, have tried very hard to accommodate the, the sort of questions we have about the, the deep technical aspects of Active Directory and the SMB protocol and the RPC protocols. So recently, you, given, you gave an absolutely fantastic talk at LinuxConf Australia about software patents and the danger that software patents pose to free software projects. Can you tell our viewers a little bit about that and what you see as the main threats of software patents to free software? Yes, I, I think software patents are one of the key threats to the future of free software. Um, and our reaction to that, that threat is quite important, the reaction to the free software community. Um, the point of my talk at LCA was to try to get across the idea that we have to become a hard target, that the, we have to, the free software community and the free software projects need to get a reputation among the patent troll community in particular, but the um, patent holder community in general, that attacking free software projects isn't worth it and that it will, um, it's, a, it's a high risk strategy to go after free software projects for patent infringement. And the particular strategy that I was advocating in that talk is that uh, is taking advantage of a big difference between a free software project and a typical proprietary project um, or a typical you know, proprietary software company. If a patent holder approaches a proprietary software company and says, you infringe our patent, and the company doesn't agree and instead says, well, we have a workaround, um, because of this workaround we don't infringe your patent, then the proprietary software company won't be publishing that workaround. They'll be trying to keep that workaround secret so that they get a competitive advantage over the other companies that are competing with them in that particular area of software. That means that the patent troll is then free to go on to the next company and try to uh, enforce their patent against the next company in line. That means that attempting to enforce a patent against a proprietary software company is not really dangerous to a, 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 tr a patent holder. The difference with the free software community is if we publish workarounds as we discover them, if we get the reputation for finding and publishing workarounds so that anyone uh, if, if anyone who approaches us claiming patent infringement, if we say, well, here is a way of implementing the same technology without infringing the patent, then that devalues the patent. The patent holder essentially loses the leverage they normally would have over other proprietary software companies. So in order to do that, we need to establish within the free software community a culture of developing uh, non-infringement arguments and publicizing them and working together to build up our reputation as being that that hard target. Um, you really should watch the whole talk. I mean, I encourage your listeners to, to watch the whole talk for, for more details. Part of the talk was trying to teach people how to analyze patents, how to understand how they work. There is a lot more that needs to be done. I'd like to see a, a public forum of some sort where the free software community can cooperate on patent issues and the big thing we need to overcome with that is the fear of um, the well-placed fear actually that 
um, privilege could be undermined if there was discussions directly between developers of different companies. Um, it could make it possible for patent holders to obtain information through um, when they uh, in, during discovery process in a lawsuit uh, if the information isn't protected by legal privilege. If we can solve that problem, then I think we could present the free software community as a hard target against patent holders, and we could gain a reputation as being the last people in the world you would want, want to attack. Um, and the, hopefully the patent holders will go and attack all the proprietary software companies uh, and uh, try to sue them out of business and leave us alone. Thanks, Andrew. So. Andrew, you have an amazing reputation in the free software community as a project ideas machine. You have Samba, you have Rsync, you have many other things to your credit. Um, but I, I want people to come away with the fact that you're a regular human being, you put your socks on one at a time, just like the rest of us. No, I don't. Well, okay. <laughs> you have a robot to do that for you. Of course. Thing. Yes, yes, yes. Well, I, 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 just viewers, I, I remember his very early Samba code, and let me let me tell you, he's... Oh, it was crap. Yes, thank you. Um, he's just a regular human being. So, how did you get into free software? How did you go from being, you know, uh, just a regular student uh, working on stuff to the position you are in the free software community, and how can other people do the same? How would you recommend developers follow in your footsteps and um, grow up into the free software community and become really valuable contributors like yourself? Right, yes, I often get asked that sort of thing. Um, the, there's really two answers. There's a sort of technical answer and a non-technical one. The non-technical one um, is really covered by constructive procrastination. Um, I think that an awful lot of students or a lot of people who are just bored in their job, they procrastinate. And a common way to procrastinate is you reconfigure GNOME or KDE, uh, you spend time setting up your wallpaper, you, you play with the latest applications on fresh meat and you know, try them out, that sort of thing. Um, if you can try to, instead of doing that sort of procrastination, instead go and play with some code, um, do something a little bit more constructive when you're procrastinating. Uh, that's basically how Samba came about. I was just trying to avoid writing my thesis. Um, and I think that's the way a lot of free software projects really get started. People, you know, doing work avoidance, procrastinating, and instead working on some project that they find interesting. Um, don't try to make the project be, you know, the big project that's going to rule the world. Uh, it's unlikely to happen if you try. If a project is successful, that tends to happen because you're passionate about it and you're interested in it. The more, the more technical answer, however, is sometimes people ask me, how do you learn systems programming? And it's something that I, that I care a bit about because what we basically do in Samba and in many of the other projects I work on is, is systems programming, which is not the same as kernel programming, it's not the same as application programming, it's like a mixture between the two. It requires understanding of how an operating system works while also understanding the needs of the application you're trying to develop and trying to make code work efficiently within the bounds of what an operating system can do. And the best mechanism that I've, uh, I've learnt to, to learn systems programming that I've tried to encourage some of my students to, to do is to use strace to trace some common programs. You might start with something like bin-cp or ls or a few other ones. strace them, then try to reproduce them by writing your own code, by looking just at the system, system calls that the program makes, then looking up the documentation for each of those system calls and try to produce a copy of that program without looking at its source code, just from the system call level. You'll learn an awful lot. It's, it's a great little hobby. Um, the, the first time I, I started doing this, I found a security hole in bin touch. Uh, you wouldn't really su expect that a simple command like touch, which just changes the date in a file, could actually have a security hole, but it did indeed. And uh, it's, you get some fascinating things when you look at programs at that level. And if you get into the habit of analysing programs at the system call level or at the network trace level, that will really place you in a very good position to understand systems programming at the level that you need to do to work on code like Samba or, or other uh, applications that um, rely on finding ways to use operating systems efficiently. Oh, great. Now you've scared off 99% of our viewers. Whatever happened to just start reading other people's code? <laughs> isn't, no. that the easy, isn't that the easier way? No, I, I, I don't find that... Reading other people's code is a great way to learn how to do things. Uh, I prefer really? to I, I, I prefer to trace their code to see what it's doing and then go and read the code to, to find out why. Um, 
it's just although my brain works, I, I, my eyes glaze over. If I re start reading a, a three hundred thousand line program, you know, by the time you've got to the you know twenty or thirty thousand line of code, your eyes are starting to glaze over. Um, you just start to fall asleep. Um, whereas I find if I instead stare at an S trace of the program running, or I stare at a um, a Wireshark trace of it sending packets, I learn a lot more about how it actually works, and it's. It's more exciting. It's it's more like being a, a detective in in analysing how the program works. Um, it, it might just be because you know I like protocol analysis, network analysis. I like looking at things from the inside, but I rarely find that starting from the top and reading the code for a program is actually all that helpful. Well, that's interesting. You're weird. Yes, <laughs> what, what quite can possibly. I, say? <laughs> I, I, I must confess, I find reading code just starting at the top, starting at main and going in and right. saying, okay, what is this thing doing? Right. Um, you can usually get a good idea of how something's programmed and how it's Perhaps. supposed to work. Yes, but by even for my own code, I often start with S-Trace. If I'm, if I'm trying to work out how SMBD works or WinBind or something else and why it's behaving the way it does, I might start with S-Trace, even though I've got the code. It tends to give you a more succinct view of what it's doing. Uh, in, in my view. For performance analysis, I think that's very true. That's what I would do. But for general understanding of code, especially if mm. you're a novice programmer coming in and you want to start understanding stuff, um, I don't know, I, I find maybe looking at other people's code uh, is, is a gentle introduction. But maybe that's because I'm not as smart as he is. But <laughs> <laughs> Just different, different approaches. Yes, I, I think we work in different ways. Anyway, that's absolutely fantastic. Thanks so much for, okay. Thanks, for interviewing us.